silence. How do humans embrace the next without a direction to find it? Do we wait for a crash and let survival of the fittest overcome the ruins of our ecosystems? Do we stay put while the world around us changes irreversibly? Start anew with whatever survives? And what if it is us who fails to thrive in the world we created? If the, worth, if the earth is eroding beneath our feet, are we eroding with it as a culture? Or do we just invest in smaller and smaller islands of diversity? The era of inhabiting a desert island is almost impossible for us to imagine in this day. But animals naturally deal with this phenomena all the time. On North Carolina seacoast, grazing cows set free by a hurricane swam four miles into the Atlantic Ocean towards an Outer Banks island. They were found weeks later grazing along a different shoreline and able to get back on their own, but content with the island's browse. On islands like Hawaii, there are species that don't appear anywhere else in the world. When those species don't exist anymore, when they become extinct, does that place lose part of itself too? The last native tree snail in Hawaii died in a cage while scientists watched it go extinct. Immediately, they started looking for another tree snail that could have survived, that they may have missed, isolated and hiding from predators. The Hawaiian tree snail's death could be seen as a survival of the fittest moment, and by extension, any species extinction could be seen that way. But what is the fittest of a species when the landscape keeps changing, when the rules of the game keep shifting? Other species endlings, the name given to the last of its kind, have been searched for mostly in vain. The dodo, the red-billed woodpecker, the pasture passenger pigeon, all presumably at one time capable of migrating to safer places where the environment could have worked better for them. And Bigfoot, of course. Bigfoot, you ask? A legend, a myth at best to many. How is it that, that it is an endangered species when no one has real proof it existed? What is proof of existence when a species dies off in a lab? One, in 100 years, will humans know what has become extinct only through aging data? But what if it doesn't end? What if we preserve species through isolation and research, like the high Hawaiian tree snail in the scientists' glass cages? And yet, on a few remote islands, they're allowed to remain fairly remote and somewhat wild. The domain of untouched species, such as on the Galapagos Island, some animals thrive though losing their connection to the rest of the world and to their species family. Not able to fly or swim away or to join the majority, these new species hold a survival secret. But are islands always refuge for endangered species? Scientists know that wolves dramatically change the ecosystem of Isle Royale, the isolated archipelago of islands in Northern Lake Superior. When wolves arrive on the island by crossing a 14-mile wide ice bridge from Canada, one exceptionally cold winter in the 1940s, they set off a tropic cascade that would last 80 years. The wolf consumed enough of the ballooning moose population that the nature of the island's boreal forest began to change. With less pressure from one of the Earth's largest vegetarians, Diversity, became, diversity came back to the plant populations on the island, and it began to look more like the remote wilderness it once was. Throughout the decades, though, winters became warmer. The ice bridge to the mainland disappeared. The wolves were trapped on the island. Their population thrived for 50 years until the inbreeding that would lead to their demise began. One summer, I swam to an island in a large lake in northern Minnesota. The water was cold, and I swam fast because of it, but mostly because of the tiny spark of fear that flickered deep inside my chest that I knew instinctively to keep at a quiver. It was a bit of a game that I suppose athletes engage in as they push themselves to their goals. My teenage summer job as a lifeguard didn't count as a sport, but it did give me a deep respect for water. Approaching what I perceived as the halfway mark was the most unnerving and the most exhilarating point of the, point of the swim. With my head barely above the surface, I had no way of knowing how accurate my assessment was and how much further I really had to go 
But in my mind, I told myself I only had to exert the same amount of effort to complete the crossing, a channel of deep water that separated the island from the clusters of Forest Service cabin where my family vacationed. The swim across the dark water had no fail-safes. I either made it or I gave up, rolled on my back and floated or treaded water until someone on shore or a passing skiff saw me struggling, I hoped. I had gazed at that island every summer for close to 20 years. In the deepest part of the winter, I had cross-country skied to it when the lake waters were so solidly frozen that one could drive a truck to it, if that's how you want to spend your time. But I had never experienced its islandness, its distance from the mainland, its isolation, and its separation due to the expanse of dark, deep water. The swim did that for me. As I pulled myself up, on a sun-warm slab of granite, surveying my accomplishment, the invigoration of standing there gave way to the novelty of the now distinct view of the beach on the opposite shore. And though I had seen that shoreline hundreds of times from a canoe, it now appeared like an altered place, a different land. I wondered if the swim was less for the sake of the journey across or more for that fleeting look backward to what I had left behind. Islands and their ecosystems can represent the larger whole, the mainland, in a more pristine manner. But still, some plants and animals know what is an island and what is mainland and where they can thrive in each. The eastern side of California Sierra Nevada mountains is a high desert of dry plateaus and volcanic mountain peaks. There, the massive Mona Lake forms an inland sea. Two small rocky islands in the lake are the home to the largest breeding ground for the California seagull. 350 miles south, Los Angeles County has been draining the lake's basin for its water supply for the past 80 years. Eventually, the lake's ecosystems unraveled, and the lower water levels left the island nesting areas vulnerable as land bridges connected them to the mainland. For years, these breeding grounds became accessible to coyotes that preyed on the tens of thousands of freshly laid seagull eggs. The coyote, the coyote decimated the future gull populations on the West Coast. Scientists blasted the bridges with dynamite, but the lake's level eventually dropped lower as Los Angeles' appetite for water grew. Then conservations erected electrified fences to keep the coyote out. This isn't nature out of kilter. This is us setting in motion something we don't fully understand or care about. Eventually, a small group of passionate citizens and thousands of Save Mona Lake bumper stickers actually did help change regulations and save what was left of the lake. The lake began to fill up and the land bridge that coyotes used to reach the nesting areas disappeared. The birds are thriving again, but coyotes are patient and remember and wait for the dry years to return. In a faded color photograph, a man stands on the side of a dirt road next to a field of crops. The man is not a farmer. He wears a worn fedora and his dark pocket protector is noticeable against his white shirt. He takes a demonstrative stance next to a telephone pole. Signs are tacked on the pole at uneven intervals the highest reaching over 20 feet above the top of the man's head. The sign contains numbers in dark block letters. This is a rural area, and the man would have had to have a crane to place the highest sign, which simply says 1955. The signs are indicators where the height of land used to be before farmers quickly drained the deep aquifers below the surface. This is California Sacramento Delta, where subsidence is permanent and creates sunken islands of rich bottomlands protected from the river's waters by aging levees. Even if farmers stop pumping the groundwater, the damage to the sunken islands will not recover. In the last century, when levees broke, when levees broke, towns and counties in California Center Valley drained the water and fixed the earthen levees until they kept breaking again and again. Today, new lakes exist where humans just gave in. Disillusionment is not loss of hope. It borders on too many dangerous things. Apathy, despair, fragility, rebuke, dejection. Yet it is none of them. It is something else, 
a signal to move on, an indication that something different, something new is needed. The pain in disillusionment is not having control over the outcome, not knowing the correct direction, the next path. The loss and being lost overwhelm until one settles the mind. Islands offer glimpses of the life left behind, the mainland, the motherland, the departure from the norm to reach the isolated. This model doesn't really hold when one thinks of densely populated islands like Manhattan, but, but still there's an identity to places connected only by bridges and water, the journey over which removes us from the ordinary. Even populated islands are significant in their separatism. They're the end of the journey, a break from the mundane. How privileged are people who live on islands? Or is it just that they are quarantined from the rest of us that makes them appear exceptional? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mary. Um, well, it was so wonderful to hear, and especially that ending, yeah. I mean, that really hits home. And you wrote this last fall. This last November, and then tucked it away and have been writing very different. But it, when I went through kind of a, the catalog of things that fit somewhat 10 minutes, <laughs> it popped up and I hadn't read it since I, I had read it uh, kind of in a workshop and I haven't read it since. Well, I published it a little for here, but I, I was very surprised because I'm feeling a lot of the same things. And yeah. um, you know. Anyway. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing it. And I can't wait to chat about it more when we get to our Q&A. Um, but first, let's hear from Vincent. Um, I'm really excited to hear whatever you're going to read. Um, I've had, seeing as we haven't met, and um, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of sharing a meal with you at the Headlands or anything like that, um, I spent a good portion of today reading a lot about a lot of your interviews and different works I could find online and spent a wonderful day involved in your imagination and world. So thank you. <laughs> it was great. Um, I will read a brief introduction and then Vincent, you can um, please share with us. So Vincent Chu is a Bay Area writer and the author of the debut uh, story collection, Like a Champion, which you can purchase through the booksmith. His fiction has appeared in Still Magazine, Fjords Review, Pithead Chapel, Pink Magazine, and elsewhere. He, um, he is the 2019 Hambidge Center Fellow and member of the Writer's Grotto, which I was a member of for a while too. We can chat about that later. Mm -hmm. And obviously a Headland Center for the Arts affiliate. Um, he's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net, and he has his BA uh, from UCLA. Sounds awesome and lives in San Francisco now. So uh, welcome, Vincent. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, and thank you, Evan. It's really great to be here tonight. Uh, and thank you, Mary. That was really beautiful. I really enjoyed hearing that. Um, so I thought I would read uh, something a little bit different today. So normally uh, I read short stories and I've written short stories for a while. Um, and I normally read from this book and I was actually very uh, lucky to have the book launch for this book uh, about two years ago uh, with Evan at uh, uh, Booksmith's Bindery. Um, but I figured I've read enough of these stories and I wanted to read something new. And uh, for the last two years, I've been slowly but steadily uh, working on a novel. And uh, this is my first novel. It's a little bit different uh, from writing short stories, so it's been a fun uh, learning experience, making that shift. Um, but yeah, during my time at the uh, Headlands, this is what I plan to be working on. Uh, it is yet to be titled. Um, it is a novel that I would describe as sort of a, a comedy, hopefully, uh, and a little bit about travel, uh, but also not about travel. Uh, so I thought I would just read maybe uh, the first one or two chapters of this manuscript. The moment had come. 
Georgie had fantasized during long walks on his lunch breaks and while washing dishes at home in his depressing but clean kitchen about how this conversation would go. But now that he sat across from Mr. Khan and saw how large his pores were and how thick his facial hair was, Georgie had second thoughts. It took a grown man to be called Senior Director of Accounts at Oats Technologies, and that's what Mr. Khan was. The kind with children and leather gloves in the winter and big 40th birthday parties. A man whose every action seemed deliberate and meaningful. When Georgie did things, even give his mandatory account updates, it seemed as if his colleagues found them unnecessary and annoying. Mr. Khan leaned back in his Danish chair and opened the window blinds, those pores. They were deep and threatening, and Georgie tried to imagine how God's skin might look this time of year. But Mr. Khan was no deity, just a mortal doofus like the rest of the senior management team at Oats Technologies, a doofus who wrote cheers at the bottom of his emails, even though he had never been to England or Australia and didn't have the kind of good-natured charm Georgie felt you should have in order to go around saying cheers to everyone. <laughs> Georgie wrote kind regards in his emails. Mr. Khan, Mr. Khan cleared his throat. Georgie leaned in. I want to say something. Me first, said Mr. Khan. Of course. Georgie, you're done. There was a proposal for a performance improvement plan, but you know what I told Jacqueline downstairs? What's the point? Well, there must be a severance package. Two months. Georgie looked out the window. A pigeon on the ledge was either missing a leg or just standing at a weird angle. I suppose that's generous. Now, what did you want to say, asked Mr. Khan. Well, I was going to tell you today that I want to quit Oats Technologies to travel the world for one year. I've been reading about it online and in print, and experts say it's healthy for the modern employee. It can provide clarity and direction. Mr. Khan smiled. That's fantastic. You really think so, said Georgie? Now we don't have to pay your severance. But you fired me before I could quit. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Says who? You scheduled this meeting. Georgie remained silent as Mr. Khan turned his attention to the framed Grand Canyon poster across the room with the word courage printed in orange along the bottom. You win, said Mr. Khan. I'll pay the full two weeks of your notice, but you can leave as early as today. What do I tell people? Uh, I'm not HR, so I can't tell you. And my LinkedIn profile? Go ahead and keep your title through the month. And after that, Mr. Khan mimed a distant marquee. Competent account manager seeks new opportunities. Georgie signed the papers and left Mr. Khan's office before the half hour was over. Oats Technologies did not encourage personal items in the office, so it didn't take long for Georgie to clear his desk. It was a shared office, and while he packed Joan, account manager three, north, and Mohammed, account manager two, south, buzzed about requesting the juicy details. Georgie was surprisingly good at pretending to be too overcome with purpose to elaborate. He provided a lot of strong but vague statements like, I warned them this was coming, and of course I'm not sad. They didn't fire me, I quit. His two esteemed colleagues ate it up. Before returning his HP Pro book to IT, Georgie collected his Tupperware in the kitchen and sat in the empty break room to send his goodbye email. He had already prepared a draft and edited it multiple times over the past year, so it only required pasting into Outlook and adding recipients. Group email lists made the process easier. Accounts, purchasing, finance, product marketing, sales, lunch Uno players, meeting leftovers, RDD, Ting Z, Sarah C. The final paragraph read, of course, let's do stay in touch via the usual channels, i.e. Facebook, LinkedIn, and my personal email you can find below. I will look back on these past 10 years with fond 
fond memories. Kind regards, Georgie. He reconsidered the second use of fond, but in the end, he decided he wanted to keep it. After returning his key card, Georgie prepared for his final walk goodbye through the office. He did not expect the dread he was feeling, but he put on a professional face. Luckily, most colleagues did not know about his recent decline in performance. He whispered a few reminders to himself while he walked, proactive, not reactive, cheery, not dreary. Mr. Khan once shouted at the customer service team during their quarterly team building event. George started by conference room west. By the time he reached printer station east, the court of public opinion had reached a decision. Upon hearing the news, people in the office were more interested in Georgie than they had been during his entire career at Oats Technologies. Specifically, they couldn't hear enough about this amazing trip he was planning. Where will you start? How many countries? My yoga teacher just came back from Kathmandu. Will you go there? My college roommate moved to Hong Kong. Want her email? Is your family excited for you? Are you backpacking? Have you ever stayed in a hostel? What about the attacks in London and the monsoons in Bali? What will you do for money? Are you traveling the whole way alone? In his final hours at Oats Technologies, Georgie was fascinating and special and the center of attention. He tried his best to answer each question, but the truth was he hadn't done any real planning yet. The idea of quitting his job and traveling the world was a sincere but still general one. A fuzzy image of diving into turquoise waters, neon night food markets, riding camels over dunes, scarves. But he made a promise to everyone that he would document his travels for them to see. Before he knew it, Georgie had invited everyone to follow him online to stay updated on his adventures in each and every exotic new location. Photos, videos, a weekly travel blog. Everyone in the office declared eagerly that they would. It's just like the amazing race, said Mohammed. Outside the main entrance, positive energy flowed through Georgie's body. It was a strange new feeling. Walking into Mr. Khan's office that morning, Georgie didn't know if he would really even go through with quitting, but now he was convinced the right choice had been made. Sometimes fate had a funny way of nudging you in the right direction. Though two months of severance would have helped. Mr. Khan, the prick. But there is no point in holding a grudge or dwelling on things beyond your control, Georgie knew. What could he do after all? Well, in a few months, he could email Mr. Khan a selfie while drinking a cold Guinness in some quaint hobbity pub in the lush green plains of Ireland with the cheers, with the caption, cheers, you cunt. Yes, he could always do that. Georgie cut across the grass and around the statue that resembled a dying cockroach. Will you make it to Rome? Georgie turned. It was Sarah C., copy editor two, corporate affairs. I always wanted to go to Rome. I came by your desk earlier, said Georgie. Offsite training all day, said Sarah C. She did a small mock celebration with her fists. How to influence people without being manipulative. It was Friday and Sarah C was wearing a loose blouse and jeans. She still had her tan from her vacation in Hawaii last month and she looked nice. You heard about my trip, said Georgie. She held up her phone. Good gossip travels fast. And I remember you yapping about it years ago. I guess it was time to put up or shut up. Appears that way. What about that sweet girl, the computer programmer? Is she joining you? Oh, that wasn't so serious. Bernard keeps declaring we should travel more. Get out of this big, dumb, homogenizing city. I guess we'll just have to meet you at one of your thrilling destinations, she said. You're welcome to join, Georgie smiled. He noticed her ring was always twisted around, so the diamond faced the inside. She was probably embarrassed to be engaged to a loser. Bernard, the loser, neurosurgeon. Are we connected on Facebook, asked Sarah. I thought so, but maybe not, said Georgie. She tapped on her phone. I was thinking, he said. 
Maybe we could still go for enchiladas sometime. We're friends, she said. She held up her phone on Facebook now. Oh, great. Sarah C turned off her phone. I'd like that, but Bernard would want to join and he may hates Mexican food and spicy food and also now salt, carbs, and bad fats. She looked into Georgie's box. She picked up the stress ball shaped like a flying saucer and squeezed it. I hope you find what it is you're looking for. It's just a trip, Sarah. It's what people do. But not usually people like you. Georgie took back the stress ball. I'm going to document my travels online for everyone. I can't wait to see. Just promise me, don't go overboard with the sharing. You're better than that. Well, I might start with the nudist colonies of Finland. Sarah C. laughed. If you can't find happiness there, you may not find it anywhere. Kind regards, Sarah C. Take care of yourself out there, Georgie. She hugged him goodbye and even gave him an extra squeeze at the end, as if she knew this was probably the last time she would see him. She joined a group of colleagues laughing on their way inside, and Georgie went to find his car. He closed the door and slid the key into the ignition, but he didn't start the engine. He took out his phone and began scrolling through his various news feeds. After what became an hour, he opened his own photo gallery. He found a picture he took upstairs of his empty workspace. He opened Instagram and added the photo. He didn't have many followers, but he liked to post photos anyway, mostly sunsets and funny cafe sidewalk signs he saw around the city. He went through the different photo filters and finally selected the Ludwig filter. It made his workspace appear a bit brighter and happier, less moldy seeming. He added the caption, as one chapter ends in life, another begins. He posted it. Georgie started his car and drove home. When he went to bed that evening, the picture had two likes. One was from an account he didn't know that only posted Amazon coupon codes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. That was great. I, um, it's such a shame with the uh, virtual thing that you couldn't hear me laughing oh. <laughs> at all the different times. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, just the the different ways of signing off of like peers <laughs> that really made me laugh, especially the idea of like getting back at someone by posting a picture in the pub years later. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, apologies for the virtualness and not hearing us all laugh, but that was really um, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Uh, so now we have an opportunity to talk with um, Vincent and Mary, and I encourage all of you who've joined to um, post uh, questions in the chat room. Um, there is no question too big or too small. So let us know what you're thinking. Um, in the meantime, I'll uh, get things started. Um, I'm just gonna make sure I have the chat thing here so I can see it. So this was so much fun and um, it was so wonderful to hear both of your works. I mean, uh, Vincent, yours was, uh, like I said, I was laughing a lot and um, I have a lot of questions really about, uh, I guess, well, when I was reading your stories, which are like so rooted in place, you know, and then you mentioned that this, um, novel you're working on is has travel as a, a serious element of it. Um, I'm kind of curious, like how how do you how is place working in your new project? How are um, the voices that came out of the stories that you were writing were so rooted in in the place they came from, in and they were so kind of like evocative of a place. And so, how is that sense of place, which is clearly part of your authorial voice how is that operating now in a new project that has to do with potentially traveling the world sure yeah um that's a great question um i think like you said yeah place has always been pretty important um in a lot of my stories and i think i 
often focused on places that were a bit more mundane. So a lot of the stories um, take place in an office or um, among friends, uh, uh, you know, in a store on the street. So a lot of them are not really in exotic uh, locations. Um, and I think with this um, novel, and I'm maybe about halfway through, it's, it's kind of hard to tell uh, when you're in the middle of it. Uh, I hope I'm at least halfway through. Um, but because the theme is sort of uh, travel, I think it's really great. It's fun to have a chance to uh, write about um, locations and places that are perhaps a bit more exotic and perhaps a bit more beautiful, um, but while still keeping my um, kind of aesthetic or, or, or mm -hmm. preference, which is to not um, kind of go too far with it. And with this concept, it kind of works. Um, I don't want to um, say too much about it, but it, it's kind of a, a, a happy medium. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited to have the opportunity to really uh, explore place. And I, I think, um, you know, with my writing, I've done it a little bit, but I haven't gotten to really stretch it and be a little bit more descriptive and be a little bit more evocative when it comes to place. So I'm looking forward uh, to doing that here. And um, yeah, I mean, as you could tell from the beginning of this novel, one of the themes is, you know, the idea of travel as an escape. And mm -hmm. for myself, and I, I know a lot of, you know, my friends through the years who have, you know, like many people had to start working, you know, once you're done with school, whenever that is, you've got to do something to make money. And um, I think those sort of ongoing frustrations with work, whatever that work may be, and, you know, uh, uh, this idea of knowing, you know, that there are all of these beautiful places out there and locations. Yeah. Um, I, I just, you know, over the years, uh, especially earlier in my life and in my 20s, this was just a constant kind of uh, area of, of sort of conflict and frustration that uh, <laughs> felt like uh, me and, and many other people had as far as, you know, wanting to escape and wanting to have something um, like that to ease a lot of the kind of struggles of modern life. Uh, so I thought, well, what if I can... Uh, Sort of come up with a premise where I can kind of dump all of those uh, frustrations and challenges and fears and anxieties uh, into one sort of uh, adventure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting because um, we can really like romanticize place as an escapist kind of thing. You need to travel um, different locations. And I find, you know, in Mary's writing, which is so rooted in landscape and in places, um, I guess in some ways, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know that I've gathered that, Vincent, you've traveled some, so perhaps this is based in a lot of your own, like, worldly travels. But uh, no matter what, when you're writing, if you, you have to, like, research the place that you're going to be writing about, right? And Mary, you research, I know, a lot about the landscapes that you write about. So I guess... To both of you, I'm kind of curious, like, where does that um, intersection of intimately knowing a landscape that you are setting a scene in and um, researching it, like, how do you approach that mixture of the intellectual and the experiential? I don't know if <laughs> maybe I, I can go at that again, but if either one of you wants to bite off that one. <laughs> Ray, do you want to take that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll take it. Am I on now? You can you hear me? Yeah. Um, most of the places that I write about, I've actually been in and working in, but not all of them. Um, and in, in this story, yeah, I have. But um, knowing um, certain places, I, I, I'm going to reference uh, Vincent's work that you know, I was going to say anybody who's had a day job <laughs> can 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 relate to that whole, you know, scene. Um, and, and I thought you just handled that so well. So when I look at some of my work, um, I look at it as I'm just bringing out um, aspects that we as a general public maybe don't see when we 
go to visit these lands or when we think of wilderness or when we think of the environment and when we think of ourselves in that land. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it a really interesting time um, writing about that because, um, you know, everybody's just chomping at the bit to get out. And I guess Yellowstone was so packed and it was it, yesterday when it opened, it was, it was hard to look at. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, there's that connectedness that I've always felt with the land. It's it's getting harder and harder to find. Just mm -hmm. kind of like it's getting harder and harder to commute. But boy, when the cars go away, <laughs> they're pulling people over for 120 miles an hour. And yeah, <laughs> and so there's this there's this you know us and the environment. And mm -hmm. um, I do place myself there, and I do get a lot of inspiration when I'm at a place. I mm -hmm. um, if it's someplace that I'm visiting, I, I will do a lot of research. So when I get there and I've landed, um, I can go discover some of the places. And then that changes so much my emotion towards it. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important to me. And hearing Vincent, you talk about, you know, getting out of school and, have, you know, basically the whole day, day job syndrome. Um, that's all there no matter what what artists do to support ourselves. Um, you really capture that. And I like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing um, with uh, my readers and the environment. Um, I, I think I know certain things about the environment because I, I am able to, for my, my job go out and 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 experience and research and there is a lot of reading i mean all the mm -hmm. the details about the failures that that's nothing i make up i i really um rely on the science and i work with scientists in my visual art practice but um i don't know if i've answered your question but it, it it's all experiential and i think any writer you know what what you write about um uh you most people really know it either that or it's fantasy writing which is also really cool because then you know your own fantasies um but so i think it's just grounding yourself in what you're writing and for me it's walking in the woods and and noticing things um and and then research yeah yeah sounds like a huge mixture yeah kind of, kind of like a real-time mixture because without the re without the, the without the experience um I don't think any writer can actually grasp the emotion of what they're trying to mm -hmm. convey it, unless they actually somehow experience that mm -hmm. and um, either talking to people who know what they're doing or actually going out and doing that. Yeah. Um, I did spend time in the Silicon Valley many years ago, um, freelance writer as a day job. And so Vincent, what you were writing to me was just um, very familiar. <laughs> yeah. It was very <laughs> disturbingly familiar. <laughs> yeah, disturbingly familiar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I agree maybe to add to that. I think it's really interesting um, sort of the relationship between kind of the sensory uh, experience you have with a place and the objective experience you have with it. And um, I, I'm trying to explore that a little bit now. And I think a good example is just hearing uh, Mary's uh, uh writing now it's it puts you in that place so vividly mm. right and you can really experience it and feel it um and i've always been interested i'm sure um you know all of you have had this experience where either from uh, watching a movie or a documentary or reading a book uh or some other experience of a place outside of physically being there you know it paints this really vivid uh, uh picture and it's very real right and you have this uh, response to it and then maybe when you go there and you actually experience it in real life it's a little bit different right for better or worse right sometimes it, it might be more than you expected sometimes it might be less um and i think that's that's always uh, uh kind of interesting to to look at uh kind of where that disconnect sometimes lies between yeah. perception and reality yeah yeah that sounds really rich. That's really interesting. Um, I, uh, oh, I have a question here from Heidi. Um, thank you so much to Mary and Vincent. I loved both of your readings so much. How has the quarantine affected your practices? Have you been able to focus or has it been more difficult? I don't, um, who wants to go first? 
<laughs> Vincent, you want to jump in? Yeah, I can. Um, so I was in kind of a funny situation. So right as uh, the quarantine happened, I also got uh, laid off from my uh, day job. And so I had a lot, a lot of free time. And uh, I was very excited about that at first, as far as writing and being more uh, productive. And I think uh, <laughs> this is just for myself. I obviously everybody has different ways of working. But I think for myself, there is a uh, definitely a happy medium. Uh, and I think, you know, Obviously, in, in normal life, when you're very busy, it, it's very hard to find time to consistently write and get into the space you want to get in. But I think you need a little bit of that busyness, at least for me, I found that that helps. Um, and during quarantine, when I had all this free time, and I guess on average, maybe I was a little bit more productive, but given how much uh, free time I had, uh, it was just harder to kind of, uh, I don't know, use my brain uh, I can't put it any other way, but um, yeah, so I guess it was a little bit of, it was a little bit of both, but um, I, yeah, I would say overall, maybe on average, it, it helped a little bit. Cool. <laughs> um, I'll pick up on that. I, I, um, so I came back from a two month residency that was quite intense and really working um, in a beautiful studio in a beautiful setting. And, and some days we, some weeks we just worked seven days a week because it was so rare and we had two months. Um, it got cut short because they had to close and we had to get home right, right at the shutdown. I think we got home the day that uh, the state shut down. Um, and I was just stunned for, two, for like two weeks. And I had no, you know, I mean, it was like, well, I came home. I didn't have any, we didn't have any groceries in the house and that, you know, restocking that like, with uh, delivery and uh, on curbside was challenging. Um, but I took that opportunity to just, you know, let some things unravel. Um, and so I didn't put in the very first part of it, a lot of pressure and kept a, a, you know, kind of a robust journal that I had been keeping since the beginning of the year. And it was interesting. I kind of went from that to the quarantine journal type idea. And that, that was somewhat curative. That really did help me to just be able to do that. And I had started that during the residency in addition to other things I was doing, but um, just some days to rattle on and some days just to write, it's raining today, you know? And, and, and that was, um, I don't, I'm not that consistent uh, during, uh, well, before I guess shut down, I'm not that consistent in a journal um, to keep that because I'm focusing on other writing so that 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 was helpful and mm -hmm. and right now i feel um i'm indulging in the moment a lot <laughs> just um uh, uh working uh, getting more and more productive um in, enjoying being um enjoying being at home in that i'm working at home i haven't worked at home in many years and so um that was helpful um but you know, like all of us, it's going on a long time. I'm I'm in a high risk area, high risk group, so I will be indoors a lot longer than um, a lot of people, and so I'm just um, resolving myself to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such a mixed bag, you know, between yeah. having a lot of time and not being able to get as much done as you thought you might, to um, making making like the best of it but by that I mean like making something of it like journaling is such a fantastic thing to be doing but then also recognizing that it's not changing over in a day or two is it it's like a long haul um you know Mary I was thinking about your residency and about your our, uh, your visual practice and um uh, for those of you who haven't like had a chance to explore uh, Mary's work. Um, she's worked with her partner Daniel on the watershed sculptures for a while, right? Yeah. Um, making like installations that um, have a real environmental impact in the landscapes that they're placed. So I've kind of always wanted to ask you this question. <laughs> and um, Vincent, I'm curious what you'll uh, think of this as well, because, you know, um, your fiction is really rooted in. Um, 
I mean, at least the the stories that I've had a pleasure of reading seem, and as a writer from the area, are you know really rooted in like the kind of people of this place, and um, uh, and so I feel like this applies to you as well. But the question I've always wanted to ask you, Mary, <laughs> is with your work that is like, literally makes an impact, like actually impacts in the full sense of the word the landscape that it is placed in. Um, when you are writing and you are working on your writing practice, like how do you view the impact that writing can potentially have in the world, in a place, on people, when it is not the physical structure that is the visual art practice, but is this ephemeral world of ideas and language, which is, you know, something that gives me some heartache sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just curious, like, you know, where, where does the impact of writing a begin, um, what, is, what are its possibilities? And, and how do you view that when you sit down to write? Is it something at the foreground of your mind or is it just in the back pocket? Let's not worry about it. Let's just get the, the story or the, um, the landscape, you know, the, the written landscape on the page. Well, I think um, it, it's a little bit of both. I think any writer, um, uh, or I, I, here's how I look at it. I want to be true to um, my ideas and my concepts and my expression. Um, but I, I, I also want other people. I, you know, I'm one of these artists and writers that I want my work seen by other people. I, mm -hmm. I, it, 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 for me, it, it's not in a gallery setting. So I want it seen, I want it communicated. And when we do, when I work with my partner and we do work on the land, we work with the community. We, we actually do quite large projects and there's just two of us. So we, we get a great amount of community input and volunteerism. And that is so rewarding. That does fuel me. The writing, my challenge with the writing lately is um, to make uh, some of the research that I have done um, to bring it in a, a not a more positive, but um, to have it uh, communicate more resiliency um, mm -hmm. that um, it, and, 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 and part of that is knowledge. So I think if uh, kind of, I guess you could say that's a goal of my writing is if people knew what I knew <laughs> about what, what some of the things that um, humans are doing to our, our lands and our environment. Mm -hmm. And we're all just individuals and a lot of it is, um, you know, out of our control. But if, um, if we knew more of how we got here, um, we maybe can change how we get there 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And so much of what's happened in our world, and this is all of history, but so much of what's happened in our world really goes back 80, 90, maybe 100 years. And those stories aren't just quaint historical, there's some real lessons in those to, to understand. And so I, I see some of those, I, I um, research that. And pretty much the first thing I do when I go to a project is try to figure out how the heck did this happen? How did we get here? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the, the residency I was just at was is in Tennessee, and it's actually in Civil War country. And the mm -hmm. scars of the Civil War are still on the land that I was staying in, mm -hmm. staying on. Um, and there's a lot of quaintness, and there's a, a, a I stayed in a cabin, and it's really beautiful. But there's still the scars of that war. So. Um, there wasn't much of a skirmish, and this has been 150 years, but our lands have been used for so many different um, political, personal um, um, aims. And I, I think um, hopefully my writing reveals the land, lifts the cap on what's still there, what should still be there. Um, I, I get amazing stories from people right now and pictures on Facebook of what the what the um, the natural world's doing right now without us, and it's mm -hmm. wonderful. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Like birds are doing things, and uh, you know, the, the the whole thing is playing out while we're looking at it through windows. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, what you can, I mean, there's lots of us that can't change that. But those are kinds of the things that I'm trying to tap into, maybe more conceptually with my writing, is that um, there's this whole world we have to start balancing ourselves with. And, and, and the natural world is real important to all of us. If we could, you know, make some compromises and make some concessions, you know, we don't have to have species in a lab that are just preserved. And, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for that good question. Yeah, and I can add, uh, yeah, you know, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, in general, any time you can sort of experience uh, the world from a different perspective, right, I think that will reveal um, lessons that can be learned, um, just things that, uh, you know, I think writing and fiction in particular is one of those mediums um, that really lends itself well to jumping into somebody's head and getting to understand a different perspective and how um, a different community, a different group, uh, you know, sees, um, sees the world. And I think all of that, um, you know, lends itself to sort of a learning experience, right? And um, yeah, I, um, I think as, you know, diverse as our world is and as our country is and, you know, you meet a lot of different people, but surprisingly, when you look at a lot of art and, um, you know, whether that's uh, film or something on screen or, uh, you know, in books, it's, it's easy to see how trends kind of happen and things all start kind of feeling um, the same way. So I think it's important, um, yeah, to, to uh, you know, when you can... Uh, get sort of insight into, you know, these different minds and uh, these different perspectives um, from different places and um, environments. Uh, I think that's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Oh, this has been so great. And I, I actually have like so many other things I could ask you guys, but I, um, I don't want to overstay our welcome and we're here at eight o'clock. Um, I will leave with one very quick question for both of you. So, um, Vincent, I was reading a bunch of your interviews and I found out that you have been catching up or exploring uh, Murakami and his work. Um, and I was just very curious, like, what you guys are reading during quarantine, you know? Or is it is it all Haruki Murakami all the time? Is it like other stuff? Uh, Mary, are you reading like field guides, you know? Um, I'm curious if you could just name a couple books that you've been enjoying recently. Um, I feel like it would be a nice end to our session together. Sure. Um, I can maybe throw a few out there. I'm kind of notorious for, I'll have a few different books going at one time. Mm -hmm. I'm a slow reader, so I'll mm -hmm. just kind of have <laughs> yeah. a few books that I'm at various stages of and I'll just kind of jump in. Um, a few that are at that stage now, uh, I'm reading There, There by Tommy. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Mostly Dead Things uh, by uh, Kristen Arnett, who I uh, learned about just years ago from Twitter, and she's hilarious on Twitter, and she has a great following. And so when she came out with her book, I think it was about a year ago, I got it right away, and I've, I've been jumping uh, back into that. And uh, there was one more I read recently. Um, Oh, uh, speaking of Murakami, uh, uh, what I talk about when I talk about running. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a short little, uh, uh -huh. about running, but <laughs> that's what I've been reading lately. That's awesome. Thank you. We all have a lot of time for running right now. So, <laughs> so um, thank you. How about you, Mary? So I've been reading plays. I, I haven't oh. done that in ages. Um, at, at the residency, they, the bookshelves in each of the cabins were stocked with old books, really, and they were quite quaint. So um, I'm reading uh, Clearing the Woods by, um, excuse me, <laughs> Mark of the <laughs> <laughs> like, um, Sorry, What was the name of the, the writer again? Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I, I picked that up. And of course, I had to leave it in Tennessee. And, and so until I could get it again, um, uh, just remanded. Um, I started reading Shakespeare's Tempest, and okay. um, boy, I'm glad I had my um, little paper back from college where I wrote notes in there because it was hard to start that up again. Mm -hmm. And you know, Shakespeare wrote that during the plague, and he was on an island, 
Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> violent. So I thought, okay, that's going to be, but you know, I, I'm, I'm not as good at reading Shakespeare as I was then. But I'm also, um, because I'm taking a workshop with um, a fellow that um, just spoke, I can't, I can't pronounce his name right now, but he recommended um, Kathy Acker. And um, I, I, I'm starting in on her, which also has a lot of dialogue. So I find it interesting that I'm, you know, plays or dialogue, um, not by design, but I'm actually reading a lot of voices mm. because you know, I thought it was very interesting. I finally sat down and kind of uh, delved into, you know, and I do the same thing, Vincent. I've got three things going on until I get really absolutely, you know, I hooked on one. But, you know, I'm looking at, I'm listening to other voices and I'm thinking there's a theme there because, you know, we all don't have a lot of voices. Mm. So um, that's pretty much where I'm going with those. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. All incredible recommendations. Well, um, Mary and Vincent, thank you. This was really fun. Um, I look forward to the future of meeting you in person, Vincent, and Mary seeing you again. Evan, thank you very, very much. Um, and thank you everyone to coming. Thank yeah. you all. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you to the Headlands and thank you to Booksmith. This has been such a great opportunity. I'm very appreciative. Thank you, Mary. I, I loved your reading. And Vincent, I loved your reading too. This has been wonderful. Um, thank you for curating Emily. And um, my pleasure. Yeah. I, I hope we. Um, I look forward to to more Headlands readings coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Enjoy the Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> Enjoy respect from the normal. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hope to see you guys in in person soon. Um, yeah. And, until then, uh, I hope, hope to see you at one of our virtual events. Um, All right. Thank you, Evan. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.